Hello church, thank you for joining me today. You know, we're in this series and we're, we're going through the entire arc of scripture. And we've been through Moses and the law and uh, we're, we're, we're moving into the monarchy, the, the king, the kings. Uh, this whole series is the rule breakers and the vow keeper. And today we're going to be looking at God's vow through the kingships. And so we're going to look at Saul and David. The last line in the book of Judges shows us the state in which the nation of Israel is at, at in this point of history as you read the scripture. Judges chapter 21 verse 25. In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Israel has turned to idol worship and really in so doing they've turned their back on God. The people wanted a king like the other nations. They wanted to keep up with the Joneses. Hey, they have a king. Why don't we have a king? But in so doing, they, they reached a place where they were dissatisfied with God's leadership. Now he was leading them through the prophets and the judges, even though they had thrived for a hundred of years with, with the leadership through the prophets and the judges. Now, of course, some had been better than others, but God had always blessed them ultimately in the end. One might say they were choosing human wisdom and leadership over God's wisdom and leadership. You know, it's interesting that even though God's response was, they're rejecting me, not you, now, we're talking to Samuel, right? They don't want me to be their king any longer. So God actually acknowledges that. He still allowed it to happen. Now, Samuel, we're going to be looking at this, is the judge at the time. He really was the last judge. He, has been, he really has been a good leader, and the people have looked to him for leadership. But the opposition around them, the, the Philistines pressuring in, it was just too much. And Samuel is getting older. And his sons have, have taken over, and, and they're not the same as Samuel. In fact, we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed their gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. This kind of speaks to a bigger point where God allows us to have things because we want them, even though they... He knows it's bad. The people wanted a king, so God gave them what they wanted. Notice, though, it comes with an incredible warning in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 10 through 22. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his armies. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops. And some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. 
He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and your donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slave. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. The people were looking for a worldly king, a king that looked apart, a king that will lead them into war. Now, the problem is God was supposed to be their king. This is a great example of God accommodating the people. God does this sometimes. He gives us what we want, even though it's not the right thing. Now, we are being selfish, yet God lets us be that way and still loves us and works with us. It still guides us. It's incredible. The people chose Saul as their king, which makes perfect sense because Saul looks the part. In 1 Samuel chapter 9 and 10, we're told Samuel is literally, I'm sorry, Saul. Saul is literally a head taller than everybody else. He really stood out. He did look like a king. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20, we're told what God is looking for in a king. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. That way he will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. And it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. You see, God is looking on the inside, not the outside, not what we see. God wants a king with a heart full of his words. A transformed king. Saul is not that transformed king. Soon after he begins his reign, Saul goes against God by taking things into his own hands. So God rejects the worldly king, the king that the people picked, and sent Samuel out to find the new king. The king that God wants. The king with a heart for God. A heart after God. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, How can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. W what's wrong? they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and, and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord is always looking at the heart. So after Samuel rejects all of Jesse's sons that are there, he asks for the one son who is out in the field tending the sheep, kind of the runt of the litter, the youngest, really, 
Jesse's youngest son, David. <laughs> when David arrives, God told Samuel that this was the next king. Can you imagine that? Now, David goes on to be a man after God's own heart and, and makes many mistakes. He really does. But then he's always repenting and turning his life over to the God, just one after another. Now, just come, you know, he became the greatest king Israel had ever had. Now, notice the difference in how Saul became king at the request of the people and how David became king. The people looked at the outward appearance of Saul and assumed he was the king they wanted. He's tall. Yeah, that's him. God chose a king for his heart, his character, and God blessed the reign of that king. Now, we can't always get what we want, and I'm so thankful for that. And, and that's because it, it, it's really a good thing because we often want uh, the things that we want they're rooted in selfishness. Ever wonder why God allows certain things? Like, like, why did God allow sin to occur in the garden? Well, it's because he has given us this beautiful and really terrible thing called free will. He allows us to make choices, even though it's going to hurt us. He allows things to happen knowing in advance it's part of his plan for redemption. Think about it. He knew that the people were going to reject him. And he also knew that Jesus was going to come through the kings. I love that. So his people rejecting him as king was no surprise to him. And even part of his plan. Knowing it would set us up for redemption through Jesus. I love that. I guess, I guess the bottom line is nothing surprises God, even our sin. But if we choose to live in obedience, we get to experience His blessing rather than the hurtful consequences of sin in our lives and really in the lives of those around us, in our family. If we follow the world, we end up making wrong decisions that we regret because the decisions are based on what we want, not on what God wants. Now to change this, we must focus our hearts on Jesus and let the Holy Spirit guide our desires. Fill our minds with his word. Be a person after God's own heart. Here's a bold prayer. Your will be done, not mine.